So with that, uh, after his speech, by the way, the, the Justice Secretary is happy to take your questions. This is on the record. We are filming it, as you can tell, so this is an on-the-record discussion, and we encourage your discussion, we encourage your questions, we encourage debate. So with that, please welcome to the podium, Rimsky Pillay. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, may I express my utmost gratitude for inviting me to this event and for giving me this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. An array of celebration activities have been arranged in Hong Kong and beyond, and indeed I understand that some of the activities will take place here in Britain. Again, this backdrop I choose for the purpose of today a topic concerning the rule of law in the Hong Kong SAR, as I believe this may be a good opportunity to reflect on the fundamentals as well as to look at the role ahead of us. As you are aware, the People's Republic of China, the PRC, resumed the exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong on the 1st of July, 1997. As from that date, the basic law of the Hong Kong SAR, uh, which was enacted by the Chinese National People's Congress in April 1990, came into effect. The basic law, although strictly speaking a, a national law under the mainland legal system, is a constitutional document which provides the legal foundation for the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR pursuant to Article 31 of the PRC Constitution and of course the one country, two system policy. Apart from maintaining the capitalist system, one of the other most important aspects of the basic law is the preservation and continuation of the common law system. In this regard, three articles, three articles in the basic law are most relevant. The first one is Article 8 of the Basic Law, which stipulates that the law previously enforced in Hong Kong, that is, the common law, the rules of equity, ordinance, subordinate legislation, and customary law shall be maintained, except for any that contravenes the Basic Law, and subject to any amendment by the legislature of the Hong Kong SAR. The second one is Article 18, which stipulates that the laws enforced in the Hong Kong SAR shall be the basic law, the law previously enforced in Hong Kong, as provided for in Article 8 mentioned above, and the laws enacted by the legislature of the Hong Kong SAR. Article 18 goes on to provide that unless specified in Annex 3 to the basic law, the national laws of the PRC shall not be applied to the Hong Kong SAR. Further, it is important to note that Article 18 specifically confines the types of the PRC the national law that can be extended to the Hong Kong SAR, namely only those national laws relating to defense and foreign affairs, as well as other matters outside the limits of the autonomy of the Hong Kong SAR as specified by the Basic Law. The third one is Article 84 of the Basic Law, which states that the courts, when adjudicating, when adjudicating cases, may refer to precedents of other common law jurisdictions. In other words, the common law mentioned in the Basic Law is not confined to the common law of Britain but the common law of all the common law jurisdictions. On the face of them, these three articles of the basic law only specify what sorts of law are to be applied in Hong Kong. However, by continuing the common law system in the Hong Kong SAR, these three articles are some of the important provisions in the basic law which provide the constitutional guarantee for the rule of law in Hong Kong. The reason, in my view, is obvious. The rule of law 
is the very spirit and foundation of the common law system. By providing for the continuation of the common law system in the Hong Kong SAR, the basic law in the same breath provides the constitutional guarantee for the rule of law in the Hong Kong SAR. Indeed, the rule of law is one of the key factors contributing to Hong Kong's past and continuing success. This occasion is, of course, not an appropriate occasion to go into the details of the definition or concepts of the rule of law. Suffice it to say that the concept of the rule of law encompass a host of characteristics which are dealt with in one way or another in the basic law. Key examples include equality before the law, Article 25, the right of access to court and the right to fair trial, Article 87, the right to judicial remedy, Article 35, and the protection of fundamental human rights, including the continuous application of the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and International Labour Convention as applied to Hong Kong, which is Article 26 to 42. Apart from the continuation of the common law system, the basic law also contains various important constitutional guarantees which are essential for maintaining judicial independence and which, in my view, is one of the cornerstones of the rule of law. In this regard, one may begin with Article 2, which states that the Hong Kong SAR enjoys independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication. It is pertinent to note that the same guarantee for independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication, is repeated in Article 19 as well as Article 85 of the Basic Law. Such repetitions, if I may suggest, is unlikely to be purely coincidental. Instead, it reflects the importance attached to the concept of judicial independence by the drafters of the Basic Law. One aspect which merits special discussions concerns the final appellate court. Before and when the Basic Law was promulgated in 1990, the final avenue of appeal for cases heard in Hong Kong was the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. That position was clearly inconsistent with the resumption of the exercise of sovereignty by China over Hong Kong. And to resolve this issue, the Basic Law instead provides that a court of final appeal, the CFA, should be established in the Hong Kong SAR. There is then my favorite topic, namely the unique position, the, sorry, the unique provision in Article 82 of the Basic Law. Not only does Article 82 stipulate that the power of final adjudication of the Hong Kong SAR shall be vested in the CFA, it states that the CFA may invite judges from other common law jurisdictions to seat on the CFA. As early as in September 1991, the Sino-British Joint Liaison Group decide that for each hearing of the CFA, the court should consist of the Chief Justice, three permanent judges, which are not subject to any nationality requirement, and a fifth judge, who could either be a judge from another common law jurisdiction or a retired Hong Kong SAR judge. This arrangement has since been implemented by the enactment of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal Ordinance. Judges from overseas common law jurisdictions are appointed as overseas non-permanent judges. We call them overseas NPJ of the CFA. And they are of very, very high international standard, including leading retired or serving judges of the Supreme Court of the UK, the former House of Lords, High Court of Australia, and New Zealand Supreme Court and Court of Appeal. Most, if not all of them, are indeed household names in the who's who in the Commonwealth judicial community. Examples include 
not Hoffman, not Nichols, not Millet, and not Newberger. Other examples include Sir Anthony Mason, Mr. Justice Eason, Mr. Justice James Beckman, all of which are undoubtedly top judges from the Australian judiciary. The wisdom of allowing judges from other common law jurisdictions to sit on the CFA has enabled the courts of Hong Kong to benefit from the experience and high standard of these judges. This innovative formula has proved to be a success, both in terms of ensuring the quality of the CFA judgments, as well as enhancing confidence of the general public, as well as the international business community. During the colonial days, putting aside Privy Council decisions, which were on appeal from Hong Kong, decisions made by the Hong Kong courts were hardly cited by the final appellate courts in other common law jurisdictions. Since the CFA was established, we have seen a significant change of scenario. Judgments of the CFA have been referred to in the court judgments of the United Kingdom and Australia, as well as leading textbooks in the common law world. Best known examples could be found in the areas of defamation concerning the issue of malice, criminal law concerning misconduct in public office, public law, and also company law. Viewed from a different angle, Article 82 of the Basic Law illustrates how cross-fertilization among jurists from different common law jurisdictions can promote the healthy development of common law. What I have said thus far would hopefully give you an overview of the constitutional and legal systems of the Hong Kong SAR. What about the rule of law situation in Hong Kong? Admittedly, the rule of law has become a very popular topic in the Hong Kong SAR and that it often attracts attention in the media, including sometimes overseas media. The views expressed though through these channels are admittedly very divergent. On my part, I would invite you to make a distinction between mere assertions or subjective perceptions on the one hand and objective facts on the other. In this regard, perhaps, if I may start off by referring to the annual International Rule of Law Lecture 2015 delivered by our Chief Justice of the, Con of the Court of Final Appeal, Mr. Justice Jeffrey Ma P.J., at the invitation of the Bar Council of England and Wales, under the title, The Strain and Fragility in Tandem, The Rule of Law in Hong Kong. In that speech, the Chief Justice identified six objective factors to demonstrate the reality, and I quote the word that he used, the reality of the rule of law situation in Hong Kong. Those six objective factors are, first of all, transparency of the legal system. The idea of open justice, whereby most court proceedings are open to the public to observe, is an obvious indication to the rule of law. The fact that any member of the public is able to observe court proceedings provides an effective supervision of the whole of the judicial process. Closely connected to this is the general ability of the press to report court proceedings, which is guaranteed in Article 10 of the Hong Kong Bill of Rights. The second is reasoned judgment. As pointed out by the Chief Justice, reasoned judgment is an important characteristic of the common law and is also a crucial indication of the existence of the rule of law. This is because reasoned decisions demonstrate to the parties to the dispute and also to the world at large the precise thought process of the court in arriving any decisions and thus demonstrate that the court had discharged its responsibility of determining the outcome of cases strictly according to the available evidence and applicable legal principles. Third, the court's approach Connected to the second factor mentioned above is that a recent judgment 
indicates clearly the court's approach to the law, which is of particular relevance in the various areas of law, including that of human rights cases. Fourth, appointment of judges. The appointment and also removal of judges is part of the institutional guarantee for judicial independence. In this regard, both the relevant provisions in the Basic Law, including Articles 88 and 89, as well as the relevant local legislation, such as the Judicial Officers' Recommendation Commission's Ordinance, Cap 92, and the Judicial Officers' Tenure of Office Ordinance, Cap 433, provide a robust framework to guarantee security of tenure for judges. Fifth, effective access to the Court of Justice. The existence of an independent institution, the court, to enforce laws implicitly carries with it the necessity of ensuring effective access to justice. As will be discussed later, the provisions of legal aid in the Hong Kong SAR is a relevant factor to be taken into account in this regard. Six, and lastly in this regard, public confidence in the system. While this factor may be regarded as numerous, the views of users of the court towards the courts and their confidence in the system provide indication to support the existence of the rule of law. When the Chief Justice gave the lecture in 2015, which was after the Occupy movement that lasts for 79 days from September to December 2014, he took the view that the Hong Kong SAR passed the test after the six indicators mentioned above had been properly considered. I, on my part, echo the Chief Justice's views. Further, I would say that although about two years have lapsed since the Chief Justice gave the set lecture, the Hong Kong SAR continues to pass the test if one consider the Hong Kong SAR's current situation against the six factors mentioned above. To begin with, there is no question that the Hong Kong SAR's legal system continues to be transparent. The press continues to be at full liberty to report what goes on day in, day out in all levels of our court. Secondly, judges in the Hong Kong SAR continue to deliver very good reasoned judgments, whether in general civil cases or in controversial public law cases, including those concerning judicial review applications. Examples of such cases include those concerning the Occupy movement, as well as those concerning the dispute over whether two of the Legislative Council member-elect had properly taken the oath prescribed by the law. All these judgments plainly illustrate that judges in the Hong Kong SAR dealt with cases in a professional, a political, and judicial manner, and also strictly in accordance with the available evidence and applicable legal principles. As demonstrated by the recent judgments, no one can have any valid justification that the judges have been affected by any political or undue motives. Thirdly, judges continue to be appointed on their merits. There can be no question about this. Furthermore, the fact that the Hong Kong SAR can continue to attract top judges from other jurisdictions to sit on the CFA is a strong testimony that judges from other common law jurisdictions have no concern about the rule of law situations in Hong Kong and that they do not feel the slightest interference in carrying out their judicial duty. Fourthly, apart from constitutionally guaranteed, access to justice remains well and alive. Among others, we have a robust legal aid system in the Hong Kong SAR. In appropriate circumstances, applicants for judicial reviews would be granted legal aid so that they would be in a position to challenge administrative action or government policy with funding provided by the government. As a matter of fact, people of different or opposing political views have been provided with legal aid 
when they face litigation. These include protesters who participated in the Occupy movement, as well as those who participated in the Mong Kok riot, which took place in 2016. Indeed, as is evident from the law reports, many leading constitutional or human rights cases went before the court with the support of legal aid. To give you a favor of the extent of legal aid provided, in the year 2016 to 2017, a total of around Hong Kong 36.3 million, 36.3 million was spent for the purpose of providing legal aid to applicants of judicial review against executive decisions. This figure is not for legal aid generally, but only confined to JR against the government. And the number is, if I may repeat, 36.3 million Hong Kong. On the whole, when we take stock of the experience of the Hong Kong SAR has gone through during the 20 years since 1997, it is beyond doubt that the implementation of the one country, two system policy has been on the whole a success. In so far as the basic law guarantees the maintenance of Hong Kong's common law system, the rule of law and independence of the judiciary, it has been well mapped. The overall success so far has also been acknowledged by institutions at the international level. They accept that the rule of law and independent judiciary remains crucial pillars of Hong Kong's open society. While various freedoms and rights remain respected and defended in Hong Kong. One recent example is the Global Competitiveness Report 2016-2017 published by the World Economic Forum in September 2016. The Hong Kong SAR is the only Asian economy that was ranked within the top 10 on judicial independence out of the 138 jurisdictions and came third among all the common law jurisdictions. Judging from the events of the past few years, I will not be surprised at all if formidable challenges are awaiting us. To rise up to these challenges, I believe we must strive to implement the one country, two system policy in a way that preserves the core values of our legal system. Those core values include the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, the protection of fundamental human rights, and the integrity and quality of our legal system, as well as the persons behind. On my part, I'm confident that the Hong Kong SAR can meet such challenges as they arise and will remain an international and cosmopolitan city with respect to the rule of law. On this note, again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to meet all of you here, and if I may wish you all an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. Now we have some time for questions. Do you want to take questions from the floor? Please, if you have that, identify yourself. And, um, I'll leave it to you to Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Bristow. I'm from the BBC. Um, You've given a very robust defence of Hong Kong's legal system there, um, and yeah, I'm not uh, going to argue against that, but the fact that you've given such a robust defence shows surely that you fear it's under attack from something, and then you ended your speech there by saying formidable challenges ahead, and uh, you how we need to defend the integrity of the system. Who, who is this force, or what is this force which is threatening the system? Why do you feel you have to put up such a defence? Is that because there is a threat? And could you identify what that threat is, please? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your question. But if I may say, um, perhaps your question has a assumption, has an assumption, which uh, perhaps I do not entirely agree. I was uh, hoping you'd pass <laughs> over the assumption and agree to it. Thank you very much. Uh, I think if, if, I may, if I may preface my answer to, by saying this, I, in the course of the past uh, about five years, 
I've been traveling uh, to a few jurisdictions, and the view uh, is to, or the objective rather, is to tell people the legal systems of Hong Kong and to tell people what is meant by one country, two system. The reason why I say that is because perhaps people here in London uh, and people here in, and people back in Hong Kong are familiar with one country, two system. But my experience tells me that not everyone in other jurisdictions are familiar with what is one country, two system. I give you one example, a true example, and that is within the first year that I took up my current appointment, my position, I was attending an international conference where uh, there, was, there was a dinner about 20, 30 uh, people, and among them were top officers of top international organizations. And the lady sitting beside me, who is also a top lawyer in one of the international organization and not and I'm not criticizing her but she asked me the question she said Rimsky tell me what is one country two system how many percentage of the law applied in Hong Kong are Hong Kong law and how many percentage of the law applied in Hong Kong are PRC law in her mind she had the perception that one country, two system mean 60% of the law is Hong Kong law, 40% is PRC law. So, and, and the question asked by such a leading figure demonstrate that we should not take things for granted. People outside Hong Kong may or may not fully understand things which we take for granted. So one reason why I am uh, uh, at the risk of being repetitive, introducing the legal systems of Hong Kong introducing the provisions in the basic law is not because I am worried of anything. What I'm trying to do is to remind people or to refresh people's mind that there are these constitutional guarantees. And uh, you mentioned about challenges which I covered in my uh, speeches just now. Yes, there are challenges, but one asked the question which jurisdictions does not have challenges. I think here, you also face challenges. So when I say challenges, I think what I uh, meant and I think what I am obliged to do is as a, as a government official, I have to think of the good as well as to prepare for the worst. And I'm sure there will be challenges. And challenges will include competition from other jurisdictions within the region, competition from other institutions, international institutions or otherwise. There will also be the political situations in Hong Kong. And I think in this regard, I can be very frank. In Hong Kong, there have been a certain degree of tension. I don't think I can pretend not to see that. And that is something which any government official in Hong Kong who want to see Hong Kong uh, uh, continue to prosper, have to deal with. And one would be situation which concern the rule of law. And, and therefore, admittedly, in my position as the uh, Secretary for Justice, that would be something that I cannot avoid, I cannot <coughs> deny, and something which I have to deal with head on. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, Across the, the, the world in many jurisdictions, there's been a convergence of certain elements of, of law and legal frameworks and a, a divergence in others. What we've seen is a, a convergence of, of law applying to corporate business. Uh, corporate law is becoming more uh, aligned in many jurisdictions, um, and there's a, there's a competitive element to that, of course, it's driving it and the proliferation of arbitration, but also including litigation to report. And then a divergence uh, in terms of civil law, criminal law, and family law, other areas, which pertains, and this is, the, this, the world is going through the struggle of globalization uh, versus populism and nationalism. Um, in that framework, how is Hong Kong really positioning itself uh, in the competitive element with other uh, legal and business centers uh, London, Singapore, New York, and, and all other, others around the world, and, and a growing number of those 
those, those centers. Um, and are you specifically looking at that sort of divergence and convergence of different legal elements to keep um, you know, yourself at the front edge of competition? Thank you very much for the, for the question. I think um, you are perfectly right that there are forces of divergence, there are also forces of convergence. I think um, one way to uh, look at it is in this age of globalization, although there have been observations that perhaps the pace of globalization has perhaps slowed down a little bit, but I don't think anyone can deny that globalization or the process of globalization still continues. And uh, my way of looking at it is, if you look at legal history, I think the more the world is getting together, the more technology is advancing, the more important one would have to attach to international law, including, among others, international pri or private international law. And, and that is the force or one of the contributing factors to what we call convergence. And in that regard, I think Hong Kong is looking at it very closely. We are placing great importance on private international law, and that is in fact one of the reasons why we invited and we are glad to say that we have successfully uh, 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 enticed the Hague Conference on Private International Law to set up an office in Hong Kong. And the reason for that is because we attach importance to that. And the Hague Conference on Private International Law as an institution which preach a, an international network which can bridge and provide connection to different jurisdictions on civil law, whether in terms of family, on child, and they have very innovative uh, uh, ideas. Uh, what, one of which is, say, in the context of abduction or parental abductions of children, the Hague Convention is working very well. And they are having very innovative ideas, uh, which is one example I can give is, in the past, uh, one judge in jurisdiction A deciding cases would work on her own, even if she or he knows that another judge in another jurisdiction is doing a parallel case. They would work separately, but uh, in the Hague uh, uh, network, they have now put something called judicial conversation. So the judge in jurisdiction A can pick up the phone and say, hey, look, can I speak to judge B in jurisdiction B, so as to understand what is going on in the other jurisdiction. And the aim, the reason, the objective is to ensure that the well-being of the child in question will be protected. Now, that kind of advancement is something which Hong Kong is very much interested in, and we will continue to uh, participate. And the other, in so far as business law is concerned, uh, uh, one of the latest latest uh, issue that we have been looking at and we will be working on is cross-border insolvency, which is something I'm sure uh, you, you, you know that many uh, jurisdictions, especially common law jurisdictions, are working on it. The International American Bar Association is working on it, and, and uh, Singapore is looking at it, and the, uh, say, uh, uh, the Singapore International Commercial Court as well as the Dubai International Financial Center, all these players are looking at this, and, and we are no exception. So those would be the, the examples. In terms of divergence, I think uh, notwithstanding globalization, notwithstanding the strong need for international cooperation, I think uh, one, uh, in one fact which uh, remains true is that we need to respect each other. We need to respect the unique features and characteristics of other jurisdictions. So each of us would be at liberty to devise our own uh, regime in relation to a certain areas of law. So there is no, there is no conflict. Thank you. Henry, please, Henry. Uh, can I ask you a section rather difficult question on the, on the law of property? I understand that I'm not a lawyer. Uh, a guarantee was given at 50 years of the present system. And 20 years has gone very quickly, and so we've only got 30 years to go. <laughs> you, how do you think that the authorities, of the, how do you think China really is, over the sovereign power, is going to handle this issue, say, in another 15 years' time? It will become quite an important issue. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, first of all, I uh, do not have a crystal ball, so I can't tell what is going to happen after 30 years. I, I wish I know, because if, if, if I know, perhaps I, I can make a fortune at the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as the Secretary for Justice, as a lawyer, allow me to look at it purely, and I stress purely, from the legal angle. Of course, this question commands legal as well as political and other considerations. But look at it purely from the legal perspective. Uh, the uh, period of 50 years that people often mention in the context of the one country, two system, if you look at the basic law closely, in fact, the term 50 or the period or the reference to the period of 50 years only appear in one article. There is Article 4, and that is to say, uh, the uh, way of life in the capital systems will be preserved for 50 years. The same reference to 50 years does not appear in other chapters, in other sections of the basic law. So the way look at it as a lawyer is that, uh, legally speaking, uh, there is no suggestions that the basic law would all of a sudden expire after 50 years. And in terms of property, Again, uh, I have to confess, while you say you are not a lawyer, I have to confess I, am, I, I know very little about property law, but what I can uh, tell you is uh, there have been the granting of lease in Hong Kong for a period which goes beyond 2047. And in fact, uh, the uh, uh, relevant government officials have been, have been uh, saying that uh, I think quite a few months ago. So, on the one hand, on the one hand, um, as a lawyer, especially uh, given my background as a commercial lawyer, I fully appreciate that the international business community or the business community who engages in transactions in Hong Kong would want to plan well ahead. And there are transactions, uh, investment, which would require long-term planning. And therefore, I perfectly understand why people are interested in this question. But in the way things have been developing, particularly lease being granted beyond 2047, in the way which uh, the government has been planning ahead, in the way things have been developing under the one country, two system, I would say, perhaps you call me an optimist, I would say, uh, don't need to be over-concerned. Thank you. Time for another couple of questions. Yes. Chris Jackson, formerly Hong Kong government and Hong Kong SERG government from 2004. I, I, I wonder if you could say anything about Article 23 of the Basic Law, which does require Hong Kong to pass further local legislation, which so far has not been politically possible to do. Hmm. Uh, I think the official position uh, is this that Pun Wan is a constitutional guarantee, sorry, a, a constitutional duty on the part of Hong Kong to enact Article 23 legislations. I don't think anyone can dispute that because that is expressly stated in the basic law. And I'm sure uh, one can also go one step further to say that Article 23 does not appear in the basic law out of the blue. The drafters must have given thought to it. And point number two, again from a lawyer's point of view, and a lawyer's trained in Hong Kong, I would say the uh, task of doing the job should be best left to people of Hong Kong rather than to someone else, because we would know what is best within the systems of Hong Kong. And also, uh, point number three, since basic law allowed the continuation of the common law, Therefore, although we have a constitutional duty, and there is no doubt about it, that we have a constitutional duty to protect national security, to protect uh, our, our, the sovereignty of, of China, but since the basic law has chosen the continuation of the common law, therefore enactment of Article 23 legislation should also be seen from the common law perspective. And that would mean a review of the current common law offences as well as the current uh, legislation. And in fact, that was what had been done 
exactly back uh, on the last occasion when the government issued the consultation paper. And, and therefore, a combination of these three factors goes to support that if, we, if and when we are going to do it, it will be better done within Hong Kong. And of course, the crucial question is, is not so much about, it's, it's not just a legal question. Because if you, if you look at it from a pure legal uh, perspective, then provided the contents are good, the law can be enacted anytime. But that is in the ideal legal world. The real world, we have to consider political considerations. And admittedly, uh, that would be that is something which is controversial. And therefore, I think the uh, government of Hong Kong would have to, uh, first of all, find an appropriate time. And I think what is important is to have a good dialogue with the people to enable people to express the view so that they understand, so that they accept, because any law, uh, however well drafted, would not be of any real good if the people do not accept it. So a dialogue is important, but it remains our duty to do it under Article 23. The question is when and how. Thank you.